Honorable Senator et Senatrice, je déclare le séance. Honorable Senators, I call this me meeting of the Standing Senate Committee on Transport Communications to order. First of all, I'd like to welcome you all back. I hope that everyone had a wonderful summer. This morning, this committee is pursuing its study on the regulatory and technical issues related to the deployment of connected and automated vehicles. Urban Transit Association and Dominique Lemay, Chief Executive Officer of Transdev Canada. Merci à vous deux et je donne la parole à M. Leclerc pour commencer. Parfait. Merci, M. le Président. M. le Président. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Honorable Senators. Thank you for having invited us here today as part of your study on public transportation. In, in your study on the regulatory and technical issues related to the deployment of um, connected and automated vehicles, my name is Patrick Leclerc. The study is of vital importance with the Canadian government launching an investment plan in urban tra transport infrastructure on a scale never seen before. Indeed, the government has announced a direct investments of nearly $30 billion in the public transportation sector over the next decade. More communities for generations to come. The end goal, as we like to say, is not to build public transit. It's to build sustainable communities. To that end, public transit is the cornerstone around which active transportation and shared mobility form a vast network of efficient and sustainable mobility options. The Canadian Urban Transit Association has been exploring the impact of autonomous vehicles for several years already. If deployed right, AVs will greatly contribute to improving mobility across the country. However, they can also have negative effect if we approach them as the silver bullet that will fix all urban mobility challenges. Débutons d'abord avec le positif. Nous croyons que but let's start with the positive side. We believe that the advent of autonomous vehicles is a great opportunity to improve and complement the transit service offerings, most notably where mass transit is not optimal, in low density or low demand areas. In those cases, small autonomous vehicles would transport residents on demand or on a fixed schedule to a common main transit hub, fast and efficient. Such an approach will make the system more efficient and optimize the use of resources. From the AV debate so far, remember I said that the end goal is not to build transit, it's to build sustainable communities. The same goes here. The goal is not to deploy AVs, it's to use AVs in a way that will improve our transportation networks and lead to sustainable community building. If we focus the development and deployment of AVs mainly for private use, or to serve the purpose of moving one or two people at a time, just like the taxi industry does, then we'll definitely miss the sustainability objective. Turning all personal vehicles into autonomous vehicles will not address one of the major issues we're facing in cities, namely scarce urban space. An autonomous car with one person on board doesn't take less urban space than a traditional vehicle with a driver. The issue of traffic congestion, road capacity, and bottlenecks will remain the same. While some say that autonomous cars will reduce traffic congestion by increasing the efficiency of traffic flow, several studies indicate that AVs will actually increase overall day-long traffic. For instance, if they return home to spare parking or if they go and pick up other passengers. This would create a new type of traffic called zero-occupancy vehicles. In such cases, vehicle kilometers travel and two-way traffic will actually increase. Which brings us to the sustainability element. Currently, most discussions and analyses around environmental sustainability are focused on GHG emissions and climate change. However, to assess the overall imp environmental impact of electric autonomous vehicles, we need to perform a complete environmental life cycle assessment. Autonomous cars basically are computers on wheels. They don't have much in common with the traditional cars as we know them. Now, think of the life expectancy of your smartphone and imagine what it means for an autonomous vehicle. In a report published by Goldman Sachs earlier this year entitled Rethinking Mobility, the authors mentioned that a private autonomous car would cost about $50,000. However, the life expectancy of the vehicle, still according to the report, would only be of three years with zero residual value after the three years. When we know the amount of non-renewable minerals required in the production of a computer, it's hard to imagine how private autonomous cars could increase the environmental sustainability of the auto sector. 
Merci, M. le Président. Et en conclusion. Therefore, Mr. Chairman, this is why the federal government should show leadership and capitalize on its many programs to support demonstration projects of autonomous transit vehicles. Finally, the government should also work with provinces to make sure that regulations governing the use of autonomous vehicles is harmonized across the country and take into account the realities of the transit systems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jimmy. Uh, and please go ahead. Mr. Jimmy. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Honourable Senators. Thank you for having invited us here today as part of your study on public transportation, including automated transport. First of all, allow me to introduce myself. I am Dominique Lemay, CEO of TransDev Canada since January 2016. I am pleased to have the opportunity to meet with you this morning to talk to you about automated vehicles, particularly as they relate to your work on public transit. I would like to begin by giving an overview of the TransDev Corporation. TransDev, a multinational corporation established in France in 1954, is a world leader in the field of passenger mobility. It has a presence in 19 countries in four geographic zones. It has 83,000 employees and generates roughly $10 billion in Canadian dollars in business. We operate any number of people moving systems, including bike sharing, regional trains, light rail, ferries, and application development for travel planning. TransDev designs, implements, and operates various means of transportation that combine various modes of transport and link them with services that make travelers' lives, daily lives easier. Through its direct operations and the operations of its 83,000 collaborators, TransDev is responsible for 43,000 vehicles, which means it can, in, it can have a major impact. What allows us, uh, it also allows us to ensure that mobility can be used to leverage quality of life and land development. As the public transportation industry is constantly being called upon to innovate in how it offers mobility services, TransDevice has invested considerably in ensuring that it is always on the cutting edge of opportunities and innovations. We are convinced that the mobility of the future will be personalized, autonomous, connected, and electric. And we are taking advantage of the digital revolution to develop and offer our users a travel experience that is simpler, smoother, and that costs less, both through its ongoing commitment to invest in innovative technologies. Uh, TransDev has many subsidiaries around the world and has been operating in Canada for a number of years already. It has made a number of acquisitions in recent years, mostly in the eastern part of the country. In Quebec, Trans the TransDev team has 1,000 employees operating 550 vehicles. In York, Ontario, TransDev Canada operates more than 130 buses. And it's clear that we were uh, uh, intensely involved in uh, York's innovation showcase. In Alberta, TransDev provides expertise through its management team, which is working on extending the light rail transit system in Edmonton, creating the Valley Line in, in addition to its already impressive rail network. TransDev brings together the expertise of its international team, whose mission is to develop mobility, which includes using autonomous public transit vehicles. Canada is no exception. We had the opportunity last May to introduce the vehicle in a real-life situation in the greater Montreal area. This type of shuttle is not intended to replace the current public transit system, but rather to provide new opportunities to serve communities. Setting up an autonomous shuttle would mean that busier, air, busier areas of a community could be better served. The shuttle could be used in less accessible areas with so-called regular transportation, or it could be an interesting alternative to creating a set route for a quieter area, for example, suburbs that still need service. We gave a demonstration over four days at the Olympic Park and did a three-day trial run at the Global Public Transport Summit in Montreal. And we will be in York next November. The most recent demonstrations that we have given have accurately modeled the potential that mobility technologies have for TransDev projects within Canada. And I'd like to tell you that TransDev is not a manufacturer but an a mobility operator. The Senate Committee on Transport and Communications, of which you are members, is studying the regulatory and technical issues related to the deployment of connected and automated vehicles. 
Indeed, these types of buses are being used in public transit systems in Switzerland and France and, uh, and soon will be in the U.S. as well. We're talking about a controlled environment. We're not talking about uh, mixed flow, traffic flow with pedestrians and other vehicles. As in the U.S., it will be in an urban setting, but still a controlled, restricted setting. We believe it is important to ensure that these vehicles can be deployed in Canada, and to do so, we will need support. The key to understanding this technology will always be to see it in action. Thanks to a demonstration of an autonomous shuttle on Parliament Hill, to which you, the members of the committee, are invited, you will be able to examine the readiness of this new technology and assess its potential uses and impacts in Canadian communities. The proposed route is a loop around Parliament Hill, going by East Block, Centre Block, West Block, and the Eternal Flame. The autonomous shuttle would be, will be operating in a true-to-life situation, with pedestrians and vehicles crossing its path along the route, which still remains a controlled environment compared to the streets. Transit of Canada, a member of the Canadian Urban Transit Association, will present its autonomous vehicle tomorrow morning, September 20th. The demonstration will begin at a set to, uh, at 9.30 in the morning, followed by a private test session of about one hour for the Senate Committee on Transport and Communications. There is no doubt that Canada is truly a promising market for TransDev. To that effect, the Canadian Division is known for its dynamism. The development opportunities and prospects are like the size of this country, massive. Honourable Senators, members of the Committee, thank you for your attention and your time. We would be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. De Mr. Amy and Mr. Leclerc. Let's begin with Senator Boisvenu. Thank you, gentlemen, for appearing before the committee and for your very interesting and encouraging presentations. I do have a few questions with respect to infrastructure, which is my greatest concern when it comes to the adaptability of these new technologies. First of all, considering the state of our infrastructure, which in many cases are uh, uh, well behind what's going on in other countries, and then our weather. Six months out of the year, our roads are practically invisible. And coated in salt. I wonder how such technologies will be able to manage these elements, which may make things less safe. Well, first of all, you mentioned Mr. Senator, uh, the issue of infrastructure. We know that the federal government is making unprecedented investments of at least $30 billion in, inf in uh, transportation infrastructure, and particularly in transit. So investing in uh, transit uh, infrastructure for the future is, uh, is crucial. The government often asks us, how can you plan for the future? when we don't know what the what urban mobility will look like in 2030. That is an issue. So that's why we in and our association members have been working on the issue of autonomous vehicles since 2012. Now, as to the infrastructure, if you look at an environment, as Mr. Lemay mentioned, a controlled environment, the first test will take place in a controlled setting. So then let's say we're talking about a rapid bus system. For example, the transit way here in Ottawa, which is a controlled, a completely controlled environment, rather. So in that case, you can imagine what kind of developments will take place, and there already have been investments. So this is how we begin by viewing these things. When it comes to our weather now, you're quite right. This is something we've heard many uh, concerns about when it comes to electric uh, buses, for example. Even two years ago, people were wondering whether electric buses could really manage in uh, such intense cold as Canada have. Now, Edmonton has just, the city of Edmonton has just bought 40 electric buses, and Edmonton is not uh, a particularly mild climate. So I think that can be dealt with, and I think that will be also, also be true for autonomous vehicles. Maybe my colleague has something to add. Yes, with respect to infrastructure, the current design of autonomous vehicles allows all the equipment, any equipment to be on the vehicle. So we're not talking about extra infrastructure that would be required. 
there are five or six levels of uh, evolution of autonomous vehicles. And a zero, a zero level is a traditional bus, and then the level five means an entirely autonomous uh, vehicle that can function under any, operate under any conditions. So the, t the technology that's developed between 2009 and today has reached level four level four, in which there is a great deal of autonomy, but not under any and all conditions, only under certain conditions. And only certain companies, such as Google, have reached level four, uh, but all the other companies are working on it, including those building buses. The vehicle you will see in tomorrow's demonstration is a level three vehicle. So there is an operator, in case of emergency, who, who can override the system. But the next generation of autonomous vehicles for autonomous buses that will come onto the market will have no driver whatsoever. So when it comes to infrastructure, there are very few requirements because the vehicles are equipped to deal with these things. The vehicles that you're going to be able to test or observe tomorrow arrived uh, last night or Monday morning. It, ro it rolled around on the circuit. It uh, took note or registered every, everything that was on this loop and uh, will drive tomorrow accordingly. So there's no change to make in the infrastructure. Once we reach level five autonomy, which means entire autonomy under all conditions, there may be some equipment required in cities to allow such vehicles to communicate with that equipment and give the vehicle information about uh, its route. But we haven't reached that point yet. But to come back to safety, at this time in the world, there are about 1,000 deaths per day due to vehicular accidents. Now we're witnessing uh, the entry of autonomous vehicles onto the market. And when there's one event on the entire planet, of course, everyone hears about it. Autonomous vehicles are equipped with multiple lasers and detection systems and cameras. They've got a computer on board, and they can also communicate with a control center. So they can communicate with other vehicles, other connected vehicles. That's why we call them connected vehicles. And when we move forward, whenever we move forward and make a new step with such vehicles, safety is is paramount. So tomorrow's vehicle will have a laser that allows it to see uh, obstacles up to 200 meters away. There's a camera at the front of the vehicle, allowing it to uh, evaluate what's going on near the vehicle. There's a laser at the front and back of the vehicle that has 16 layers, allowing it to see obstacles or anything in motion. And then 30, uh, 30 centimeters from the ground, there's a laser that goes all the way around the vehicle in order to detect any potential obstacle or any moving object around the vehicle. So when it comes to safety, what those vehicles do, knowing that uh, any slightest incident will be in the media, as soon as there's any problem, the vehicle slows down or even stops, which is why you have to uh, use them only in controlled environments for now, because given all of the uh, the traffic and the congestion in today's cities, uh, the, the car would always be slowing down or stopping. So when it comes to safety, the onboard system ensures an unprecedented level of, of safety. You know, a human driver uh, is unpredictable, but a machine has parameters and is going to be able to communicate using those parameters. So it's actually a great deal safer. Clearly, autonomous vehicles will save lives. But autonomous vehicles combined with a human driving uh, will require some adaptation. And for them to be able to fulfill their full potential on routes, other vehicles will also have to be connected so that all the vehicles can communicate with each other and allow the autonomous vehicles to properly function. Does that answer your question? I have a second question. Your paragraph talks about your second paragraph talks about accessibility uh, when it comes to these new technologies. Of course, people in urban centers are going to benefit from economies of scale when it comes to mass transit. I think that you'll agree that Canada is a large country with all kinds of regions, diverse regions, and we don't want uh, we don't want to have everyone move to cities. So, how will people in remote 
areas access such in equipment, technology, infrastructure, knowing that they won't uh, have the infrastructure within their towns and villages. I'm looking at the cost here, so $50,000 per vehicle, uh, even if you're saving $10,000 in, in fuel. Aren't those people being penalized when it comes to accessibility to such technology? No, I don't think so. We're talking about $50,000 for a new product. It's as if you're comparing it's it's like any new technology the uh, widescreen flat TVs when they first arrived yes that's true but uh, we're talking about universal access in th 20 or 30 years but in the short term won't these people be penalized with uh, little access to such technology it'll be mostly people living in urban centers there are two things first of all I like to say that uh, individual uh, vehicles uh, uh, will of course uh, be more expensive at the beginning and we'll have to make uh, preparation for public transit as well. Uh, this will be uh, something that will be acquired uh, by uh, municipalities, and then maybe the equipment costs more at the beginning. But the companies that prepare these uh, vehicles are dealing with markets at the present time that will be uh, new markets. The, the solo uh, vehicle, if we're not prepared for uh, uh, public transit for uh, autonomous vehicles, then there will be new uh, markets that are being created, and this will result in an increase in the number of cars or vehicles. If you look at Google, for example, you see a new video announcing certain cars, the type of uh, population that is being targeted. They are, talking, they are uh, targeting people with reduced mobility, uh, uh, children, for example, children being driven to uh, soccer matches or whatever. And they will also target people uh, seniors who no longer have the ability to uh, drive but who want to be uh, taken somewhere. Uh, my father, for example, at 85 had to stop uh, driving. Uh, uh, he's now 91. Um, so this will create a certain market for this type of cars. But when we're talking about uh, public transit, then we're going to have to start making preparations for this. There will be costs at the social level. And the cost of vehicles will start coming down quite quickly. And I think that this is where we're going to have to start making organizations, even for remoter areas. Is it possible to have this type of autonomous shuttle uh, that would be accessible in our area on demand uh, to facilitate mobility? And this would avoid the need for a third car, for example, in certain suburbs, uh, in view of all the traffic congestion and so forth. Uh, a solo car will be less costly, but I think that uh, it will be, uh, it ended up cost costing less. I have uh, uh, Mr. LeMay and Mr. Leclerc, uh, I have a number of questions. Uh, if we want to be able to have the full list, I have a Senator Bobby, Senator Griff, Senator Eagleton, and Senator Mercer, as well as Senator Comier. We'll start with then Senator Foley topic of great interest to me and uh, uh, I uh, liked your phrase that we're building sustainable communities and re improving transportation networks. My question is very simple. I'm just back from France and I understand that uh, you're in, uh, Transdev is involved in a number of uh, pilot projects uh, in France and the first um, commercial driverless service. Now, having uh, been in a van uh, with uh, some of our colleagues driving down the highways in France, uh, which were very full, um, very short distances from vehicle to vehicle. Motorcyclists uh, driving down the white line, um, you can imagine the hair was standing on the back of our necks for everybody in the car. Uh, where do the commercial driverless service, how does that fit into that equation, which I gather the, the um, uh, speed limit is 130 kilometers unless the roads are wet and it's 110 kilometers and, and as, as situation that's quite different from here in Canada. And I found myself on that van thinking, how on earth would a convey of driverless trucks work? We uh, have to say we're not into that uh, autonomous vehicle because it, I think first we will have really the use of autonomous uh, buses and uh, shuttle in a small control environment. Then it will be in cities at lower speed. And technology will probably bring us in, in years from now at high speed on highways. But actually, 
uh, we are not there and we are not working on that. Uh, we can make some research and bring you more information, but uh, to we're not looking at conveys of uh, uh, buses uh, with people on high-speed uh, highway. So if I can just have one follow-up very quickly. What are the um, pilot projects you're doing then uh, involving the commercial driverless services? They're all in the uh, urban area, more dense urban area, and actually in more controlled area. Like we'll have one that will start in the United States. The announcement will be made in a few weeks. We'll be in a neighborhood, uh, in a private neighborhood uh, with, you know, fence neighborhood uh, the way it is in the United States. And uh, it, the, the vehicle will bring people from their houses, from their home, to the heavy public transportation systems, but not to their final destination. They, they will be used more as feeders to big okay. network, but in urban uh, environment or in uh, could be a small neighborhood also. Okay. I, I, was, I was confused by that phraseology. Okay. Thank you. Senator Griffith. Thank you. Um, just a couple of quick ones. Uh, first of all, uh, you mentioned the importance of uh, working with the provinces to make the proper regulations. Um, have you done any consultation with the provinces yourself or the organization? Uh, CUDA, we have uh, about uh, seven provinces that are a member of, of the organization, and we do have these discussions. Everyone right now is watching what's happening in the U.S. and then watching what's happening in, in Canada, and we uh, work closely with Transport Canada as well on that, what the regulation will, will look like. And uh, the, the, the challenge here is that uh, when, when you deploy like uh, public transit or even shuttles, it's, it's local in nature. Uh, uh, under, in, in some cases, using uh, uh, roads that may be provincially regulated or, or linked directly to the city, and then you'll have the regulatory environment in, in Canada. The one thing, if we want to attract investors as well and deploy that technology, is to ensure that we have something that is harmonized across the board. Uh, and, and right now, we're not necessarily seeing that dialogue happening. We see that Ontario right now, I think, is the only uh, province that has uh, allowed for autonomous vehicle to, to, to drive there. Um, but what about the, the other provinces? How can we have pilot projects that will take place in different type of environment? If we want to test it in Edmonton, then we need to ensure that the regulation is in place to allow for that to happen. Right. And. Um You've uh, mentioned a couple of things that the uh, federal government could do to show leadership. Um, if you were to pick the one single most important thing that we could do either of a regulatory or financial instrument to further the progress of autonomous vehicles, what would that be? One thing. To me, would be to look at uh, uh, pilot projects in various environments. Right now, we'll be, we see that we're testing uh, uh, the, the, the private cars, uh, autonomous vehicle. But if the, the federal government should uh, look at the programs that it has uh, put in place and, um, and use it to support the uh, development, when I talk about pilot projects, it could be, and we need to stage it. So it could be we start with shuttles like uh, uh, Mr. LeMay is talking about, and there are various models, some, some that include artificial intelligence. You have shuttles as well that are produced in 3D printing, um, and that's really um, interesting. So we, they bring some different elements. We need to, to test it. Then we need to think uh, long term as well. Uh, Daimler is, is, uh, has developed a bus called the Future Bus, and um, they've deployed it in Amsterdam, for instance, on a, uh, a bus rapid transit corridor. Uh, it's the uh, airline, you know, a, 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 um, a link to the airport, I think. Um, and it's uh, the, the bus rapid transit systems, they use segregated lanes, so it's mm -hmm. a controlled environment. Then you can look at, the, still, it's a 12-meter bus running there, moving a lot of passengers at a time. So we really need to look at the various technologies where they can be applied, and the federal government can really initiate that deployment of projects, capture the learning, see how it can be deployed across Canada, and then support. The other thing will be to support innovation as well and research and, and, and development. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Senator Eggleton. Uh, Mr. Leclerc, the... Um, some of our witnesses have, uh, have touted advantages for autonomous vehicles being things like uh, less congestion on the roads, uh, less uh, parking, and uh, greater safety. 
Uh, but you've come today and said that you think it may well make matters worse. Uh, you've said that uh, uh, if you just put the autonomous vehicles on the road with the current vehicles, uh, you and you have single passengers, uh, it's not going to be any different than what it is uh, today. You're still going to face the same problems. In fact, you're suggesting here that it could even be worse if the idea of the vehicle not being parked, say, downtown, the vehicle returns to home base, so it, it further adds to the, uh, the congestion by more vehicle movement. And on top of that, you say that uh, you compare it to uh, a smartphone in terms of the technology. Uh, 50,000, you think, is what uh, Goldman Sachs, you say, in their report suggests that 50,000 would be the initial cost of such a vehicle. Uh, but that, because of the advances of technology, it probably become obsolete and wouldn't have the trade-in value that a lot of vehicles do today. Well, how do we, how, what do we do about this in terms of the, the culture uh, that exists uh, for driving? It doesn't sound like the kind of improvements that many people are coming here talking about are going to be realized. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your question. And uh, I'm really glad that the, the committee is looking at all the options because you're doing very important work on that and advising the government. That is critical and that you're looking at that side as well. There's kind of a myth right now, and this is why we need to avoid that silver bullet approach. Everything will be fixed with autonomous vehicle. We need to deploy the technology or the solution that fits the problem. This is critical. Um, on some of the things you mentioned when it comes to congestion and parking, and uh, you mentioned congestion, parking, and safety. On safety, it's totally right. That's why I don't address it. I think autonomous vehicles, even private cars, are safer than having the driver behind the wheel because you don't have that distraction and the computer will not be texting as it's driving. So it's a good thing. So on safety, absolutely, that fits the problem. On parking and congestion, yes, you gain a parking space in, in, on streets, but then it depends how you use it. But you're not solving necessarily the congestion problem. When we see reports saying that congestion will be uh, basically fixed or improved, it's when you have all, you would imagine an environment where all the vehicles are autonomous, completely automated, fully automated like level five. Um, and then you don't have drivers in the equation. Then you optimize the traffic flow and the distance between the vehicles cause they, because the other thing is that they talk to themselves. They share the information, they know when they will break, they can follow uh, uh, one another very closely. And that's one thing we're seeing in the rail sector, for instance, with the SkyTrain and TransLink being fully automated since 1986. Then you gain efficiency when you have an automated train control. That would be the same thing here, but you need to have all cars fully automated. Now, in that process, you will increase traffic congestion and you'll keep it as well. The, the other thing where you create that two-way traffic congestion, that uh, zero occupancy vehicle, that is a problem, is that right now we have a problem with single occupancy vehicles that we're trying to fix, bring more people uh, uh, into cars, so have more of the shared mobility model. If we go to zero occupancy vehicle, we're really losing efficiency. If someone can afford to have a $50,000 car that will return home, uh, and then come back, you can imagine a, a traffic problem, let's say going from Laval to Montreal being both ways. Right now, we, you have it in the morning, just one direction would be the other direction. And when I talk about it, it's really with the, uh, the, the lens of sustainability. I don't think, the, the one thing right now, we're only looking at GAG emissions. When you look at the, um, uh, the, the GAG emissions required to extract all the minerals, everywhere to produce all the, the electronic systems we're using in our da daily life. If we produce more autonomous cars, we're not helping, we're not being more sustainable in any way. So we need to avoid that, and that's why we need to look at all the options, including traditional transit, to fix some of the problems on our highways, as uh, Senator, you were mentioning before. I don't think autonomous vehicle will solve that. I think rapid transit solutions and getting cars off the road will solve that. Um, and so it's a combination of solutions we need to have. Okay, let me ask, uh, I, I could explore that a lot further, but uh, let, me, let me ask uh, Mr. LeMay, uh, you seem to emphasize that the, uh, the vehicles you have in your network, uh, you particularly mentioned uh, Switzerland and France, are all in, in private roads. They're all off public roads. Uh, why is that? Is it, is it uh, a regulation that you're not allowed to take them on the public roads, or is it you don't have the confidence in the, uh, 
and the technology to this point to be able to take them on the public road? There's two uh, two reasons for that, and uh, it's not a question of confidence, but it's uh, yeah regulations uh, all over the world will have hard time to follow the technology. The first thing, if we look at level one, uh, level zero uh, of uh, autonomous vehicle, uh, when we st when big companies and uh, producers started to produce them, uh, that was in 2009, eight years ago. Within eight years, they've reached level four. And so we can think that level five will come very, very fast also. And, and usually when we, we sit with experts, they, they, range, they, they put a number of years and we can cut it by two and this is where it will happen because it's going, it's going so fast. So legislation has a hard time to follow and it's the same everywhere. So uh, for legislation, we would need specific uh, pieces of legislation to be able to put them on the road. The second thing is the vehicle we're using is level three. Uh, and uh, w needs an operator, and also when it goes, uh, when it sees people, it slows down. When it sees car, it slows down also. So uh, in uh, regular traffic, it will always be uh, very slow. So for that reason, and the state of the technology of this vehicle, of these vehicles, we have to uh, be in the control environment. The next level of vehicle are coming now, so uh, we will be able to do more uh, in traffic test, but still we have to be careful because one event uh, is yeah. uh, see as a big thing. Yeah. Uh, you know? Like the Tulsa event. Sorry? Like the Tulsa. Yeah, uh, like the Tulsa uh, event. The and the same thing happened with uh, elevators uh, in building. Uh, since 1900, elevators are, uh, can be automatic. Uh, they needed years to be accepted uh, at the time because people didn't want to go in an automatic elevator. And now, when we go in an elevator with an operator, we wonder if there is a problem <laughs> with it. Okay. Let me, let me ask both of you one very quick final question, because we're talking about different levels of, the, of automation <laughs> here. Um, level five being the highest level, full, full automation, um, where you don't need a, a driver at all of the vehicle move itself. Uh, how far away is that? You, you, think, uh, you think that's coming close? I'll ask both of you this. I can start, and yeah, uh, expert, some expert may say decades, or, and I'll come with, I'll answer with an example that, of something that we lived with in Transdev. T uh, two years ago, we were with a group of specialists uh, and trying to evaluate uh, the, 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 the venue of those technologies. And uh, we concluded, and uh, I'm not a specialist, I'm more an operator, but we had technical people with us, and we concluded that in five years we will be able to operate AVs commercially. That's two years ago. We do it now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if we, you look at the, those five levels, level one reach in a year, level two in two years, level three in three years, level four in four years, that makes 10 years. And they've reached level four in seven years. So uh, f personally, I would tell you it's somewhere uh, around five years from now we will be able to reach level five and even drive safely in the slope. Some experts may tell you in decades, but if we look at the past and yeah. we make a trend, it's okay. somewhere in that distance. And yeah. so we, we need regulation that will be also open to these quick evolutions. Oh, that we sure do. Mr. Yeah. Leclerc, you have any? So Dominic was brave enough to be on record saying five years, so <laughs> I won't do that. Uh, experts really have different opinions on that, and by uh, any mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on the technology. I think what you know, I'm, I'm interested in most here is to ensure that the technology will evolve by itself. Uh, we need to have the right regulation in place. The last thing we want to do is not to have the right regulations or to let the, if the technology is ready in five years or 10 or 15 or 30, um, it will have implication. So if we wait for the technology to be ready to, uh, to develop the right regulation, if it's ready in five years, we're stuck. If we develop the regulations right now and it's ready in 30 years, we're stuck as well because we'll need to review it. So that's what I'd say uh, on that okay. one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dominique, I think that we can reserve now for October 2022 <laughs> so that you can come and appear and we'll take you up on it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did not make you a promise here, but <laughs> when you look at what's happening... and You're I, with politicians, your promises happen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I, I will be here in, uh, in five years and uh, I, I will... Uh, perhaps Senator Dawson and I can make a commitment that we'll make sure you're called as a witness to to tell us 
why it was successful or why it wasn't. Um, my, my question is uh, is uh, directed to Mr. LeCook. Uh, one of the issues that I have with all of this technology is that it's urban based. Uh, it's not. It doesn't address the situation of rural Canada, and in rural Canada we have a, a, a problem with the rural Canadians being isolated, isolated from services because. Uh, their, of, perhaps of their inability to get to, to the centers where those services are available. And, and as the population ages, uh, many of those people are then are, are, are become even for, more isolated because they lose their ability to drive to get to the, get to the, those communities that offer the services. So the, and, and as, as we, those, those people have been on this committee for a number of years will know there's all, as far as I know there's only one rural transit system in this country that works, and that's a, the, the Annapolis, uh, King's Annapolis uh, transit uh, system in Nova Scotia. And that has an advantage because there's only one main highway that goes through every community along the route. And, and uh, 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 But how is this going to, you know, or, or shouldn't say, how is it going to, will it uh, be able to address the, the isolation problem for rural Canadians? Because they're there, they need services. They need they need to go see their doctor in an ur in, in a more urban uh, center than than they're in. They may need to to, to access other services uh, that they can't they, they or they have difficulty doing now. And as our population ages, the demand for this is is becoming greater. Or we force uh, uh, Canadian or Canadians who live in rural uh, parts of the country to move into a uh, a congested urban environment that uh, that they're not c comfortable with, or that is not as friendly uh, to their situation. H how how is this going to help? I can start. Oh, you, you want to start? Yeah. Oh. I can. Well, I can. You want to go? Go. <laughs> no, okay, I'm, I'm going. He's going to tell uh, us in what year it's going to be fixed. Too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you when. Yeah. Uh, no, just I'll say a few words on that, and I think with what we see as uh, pace, you know personalized, uh, autonomous, connected, and electric vehicles, that uh, with do those tools that we have now, where we can share a lot of our infrastructure, a lot, lots, of, lots of things, uh, you know, the, the, it changed the, the, the industry. And autonomous vehicle alone won't make anything. Autonomous vehicle, autonomous shuttle, with well connected uh, to the network, will be able to bring shared vehicle in uh, communities where you, you can have a shared shuttle uh, that uh, when you, you call for it, when you need it, and it, it goes into the city, grab people and bring them to their destination. This is where we're heading with these, uh, these vehicle, but it will need to be combined with the rest of the technology. But the, the, the big issue there will be the cost to the municipality if it's, a pub if it's public transit then, then, then what, which municipalities are going to be able to afford to have that service available because uh, the population is not high in those rural municipalities. So the, the tax base is not, uh, is not true. Uh, and this is a real issue that needs to be addressed that we need, if, if the services are going to be available, we have to make sure that rural Canadians have, have access to, and particularly uh, older Canadians because the, this is the population that's going to need to be ser served. I say that as a guy who's getting to be an old <laughs> Canadian. Yeah, but you just touch on, on the point, uh, Senator, that is, to me, that one of the most uh, uh, important challenges uh, we're facing, not only here in Canada, in North America, and in, in Europe as well, is the aging of the population. When you talk about isolation, uh, that's what we need to think of. You know, the uh, people who are getting older, if they can drive in there in rural Canada or elsewhere, they'll become more isolated if we don't provide better connection to them, so it's service, whatever it looks like, but it's a service that connects them to the community. Um, you're, you're, so that's why we need to, I think, develop uh, uh, solutions that are uh, people-centered and uh, that, that, again, fit, fit the, the problems we're trying to solve. Now, let's imagine you, you mentioned uh, King's Transit. Uh, King's Transit is one of our members, so it's uh, Miramichi, 18,000 people. Um, the, the type of service they have, and they run amazing service for their communities that is absolutely essential for the people using it. Right now, the people using it, they have access to a 40-foot bus that drives by one, 
once every hour. So if you have to go to see your doctor, if it's, if it's at, uh, let's say, 12.35 and the bus goes there at 12, it takes 15 minutes to go there, then you need to take the one at 12. If there's something that happens, you're missing your appointment or you have to take a taxi. If you're on fixed income, then it's having an impact on your, your revenues. So these uh, vehicles uh, can be deployed either on fixed route. So in, in urban areas, you could have them on fixed route but can be deployed as well on demand. And I think if we want to improve mobility to people, we need to look at these solutions. Uh, so the, the on demand, if the person needs to go there, can uh, summon the shuttle and then have it within, let's say, 15 minutes, drive the person there. On the cost side, uh, what's, what's the, the main cost right now for transit agencies, uh, there are, there are two, two elements. It's, uh, it's labor and it's fuel. So if you have an autonomous vehicle that is electric, then you're taking that component away. The operating system for some shuttles, and I will not get too far into that, but the operating system could be something like 10 to 15,000 a month to provide that. When we look at the, the cost of operating a traditional transit system, it's much higher than that. So I think we can really improve. That's, that needs to be the goal in what we're looking uh, for, what we want to accomplish. Be people-centered, look at the solutions that fit the community, and then invest in the deployment. I think we can offer better service to Canadians in, in rural Canada. My final comment, Chair, is, 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 is that you need to get out of your thought process the fact that the option is to take a taxi. Because in, in uh, rural Canada, there are no taxis. Yeah. And if, and, and, uh, and if, if, if you uh, hire someone to, to take you, number one, you're, you're going in an unlicensed uh, vehicle, unlicensed uh, as, as taxis are. And uh, uh, unregulated, uh, and 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 uh, uh, probably much more costly. I, I think we also need to analyze the costs that this would be for municipalities. Small municipalities cannot afford. Anyway, thank you, Chair. Senator Saint Germain, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being with us today and for such interesting presentations. I'm interested in the aspect of adapting public policies and uh, connected or associated uh, support programs. A certain number of contradictions appear have appeared to us since the beginning of our study. A, manu a vehicle manufacturer, of course, uh, wants to sell as many po vehicles as possible. So there's a contradiction there in the sense that the more people buy an electric car, the less, uh, the fewer clients there will be for public transit. And then there's the issue of people in remote areas. So the issue of having a cohabitation between uh, transportation in major cities with high capacity vehicles and uh, transportation in other areas, outlying areas and remote areas with fewer clients for public transit. In that context, what seems to be a great challenge to me when it comes to public policy stakeholders and the policies they create is having consistent policies without contradictions between subsidizing an, a per, an, an individual buying a single passenger vehicle with a subsidy which would encourage the sale of more such vehicles and creating at the same time comp more competition with the public transit. So this is my question. Do you consider that conditions are currently in place for all public policy makers at three levels of government in Canada working together with integrated policies to help Canadian public transit along with private public transit and do you think that this is possible with a deadline that will allow you to do so before there are too many single passenger private vehicles purchased? I'll allow you to answer that question. Thank you for the question, Senator. When it comes to harmonizing public policies and public policy development, I think one of the things we see often in public transit is that there are technological choices available. 
when creating such public policies. For example, tax credits for, for those who purchase electric vehicles. If you're offering people a tax credit or a sub sub which is a subsidy for buying a hundred thousand dollar electric vehicle, you really have to wonder about its impacts on society and on is there really an impact? Does it improve things environmentally speaking? Is there, will, will it lower uh, greenhouse gases? But if you really want to lower greenhouse gases, you should invest more in public transit and what, you, what we call mobility pricing, which is imposing a price on mobility. And in order to encourage the mode of transportation chosen to choose the more so people more people choose the more sustainable one the most sustainable transportation in fact isn't even public transit it's going on foot by bicycle van mass transit in cities and communities so policies should really keep in mind what these what the goal the end goal is public policies should be developed according to evidence that should be evidence-based and uh, and look uh, we should look at what's happening uh, elsewhere in the world so if we want evidence-based policies right now that's not what we have we our, our current policies uh, contribute very little to our stated goals there is an ideological bent to say well let's just carry on with existing policies what we really need to do is look at analyses we need to establish the goals that we're trying to attain and then adapt and develop public policies in accordance so you're telling us that presently there is no integrated collaborative approach between all the public stakeholders to prepare us for the arrival of autonomous vehicles at all levels of government. Well, I would say that beyond that, there's very little thought being given. This is my personal opinion about how we're going to adapt society to everything that's going to be automated, not just vehicles, but the service industry as well. On the radio this morning, they were talking about the service industry, whether that be in restaurants or elsewhere. There's a whole section of society of, and wor its workers over the last 10, 20, 30 years that are probably going to lose their jobs. How are we going to prepare society for that transition? If you look at uh, public uh, transportation, all these vehicles that need to be converted uh, is going to uh, mean that rather than having garage mechanics, we need IT technicians to deal with these vehicles. There's a great deal of debate right now around technology. Technology is definitely pushing market forces in, a certain, in certain directions, and we must uh, contemplate the social repercussions of these, of these events. Thank you. If I could add my own comments. When the IT tech, uh, sector gets involved with another sector, the innovation cycle is disrupted. We saw that in the hotel industry. We saw that in the taxi industry. We saw it in the retail sector. We can see it in all areas in which the IT sector becomes involved. Look at our phones. And it's now taking place in the transportation sector. The industry is not going to wait for us or anyone else to put its products onto the market. When computers arrived, everyone said, oh, there won't be any more paper. But in fact, there was a huge increase, and then it dropped, started to drop off. So we run the same risk here. So I remind you, if we're not ready, I believe we must urgently set up mechanisms to prepare and consult in order to be as prepared as possible to receive these changes, which may come sooner or later. Thank you. Senator Cormier, please go ahead. Thank you. So most of the questions that I wanted to ask have already been asked. Most of the answers have been given, so I'll try to move on to another question that's going to uh, summarize all of this. So we're talking about public policies, uh, provin uh, federal, provincial, and municipal. This seems like a, ma a, a, a major issue to me. They have to be aligned, uh, not only in the transportation sectors, but I'm from a rural area, and I'm quite concerned by the impact, especially the support that the federal government could provide to help regions and municipalities to prepare for all these changes. 
you aren't part of the federal government, but if you were, you talked a great deal about preparation. In your opinion, what would the, pri the, the top priorities be in order to help everyone prepare? What mechanisms should be set up quickly so that we can help regions prepare, especially rural regions, to prepare for the arrival of autonomous vehicles? Well, this question is really for someone who's more of an uh, for for someone who's more of an operator. That that's a bit difficult. But I would say, as Mr. Leclerc was saying earlier, to uh, encourage demonstration trials and error to try and demystify such things, so that the populations are less uh, population is less afraid. Those are that would be a priority to me. We're sort of feeling our way through this because what's coming at us is so different. That's for sure. So we must allow ourselves to make mistakes. We have to set up trial and error and demonstration programs. We're going to have to work with, uh, pu with uh, public companies as well in the major cities. And yes, several people have already said this. In the rural areas and in remote areas, we're going to have to begin immediately with organ with uh, orga by organizing demonstrations so that we can uh, get maximum benefit over the coming years when it comes to programs and policies uh, that's not really my wheelhouse so I would ask Patrick to answer that part of your question well f f I think an important step has already been taken when this the committee this committee undertook this study we can't just wait for the U.S. to uh, undertake all of these studies. Uh, for example, in Michigan, they're doing tests and pilot projects. They're, and then we'll wait and see what they do with their regulations and say, okay, let's harmonize ours with theirs now. I think we need to move ahead on our own. And I think at the same time, the government could really start to uh, 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 a, re a major review of public policies municipalities, provinces, and the federal government should study the economic repercussions and other repercussions and think about investments in the, in Canada because we're talking about public trans transit here. I'm, that's really the, the aspect I'm looking at. But in the U.S., there's a Buy America rule, Buy American rules. So all, everything has to be built in the U.S. using U.S. Uh, resources, and materials. So here in Canada, we have a more innovative approach, I think. And so, but we still have many issues to study. Even if we're just looking, if we're looking at only a five year horizon, well, we need to get to work right away. If over the next five years, because within five years, this, this technology may be ready to roll. Uh, but if it's going to, whether it's going to be deployed on a large scale, even if it were to start in five years, it would still take some time to deploy it across the whole country. So in the meantime, we should just keep examining all the possible options. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, <clears throat> Mr. LeMay, you mentioned in your presentation that uh, your company held a couple of demonstration projects in Montreal of late. I'm just curious if you can share with us what you've learned from the demonstrations and were there any surprises? Uh, yeah, the, the most important thing that we've learned was the reaction of the public uh, because uh, the, the test that we did for four, four days at the Olympic Stadium uh, was, uh, you know, between a, a metro station, uh, very close to a metro station, to the biodome so people could use it to, to get there. And uh, the... Uh, the openness of the public and there you know everybody they, they ask the question is it safe and we had to explain yes it's safe and if there's human uh, uh, interface to close it will stop people were just putting themselves in front of the vehicle to test it so the 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 humans we realized that it would probably be much easier than we think to have these vehicle accepted in the society because uh, they wanted to get in they wanted to test it the people wanted to 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 be in it and we uh, we also realized that you know uh, with the state of the technology actually if there is something that changed on the on the, the, the circuit uh, from day one to day two when it has been programmed so the vehicle slow down and we have to adapt it so it's not 
level three is uh, autonomy is not level five, and we, we still have some work to do. And this is why, as some specialists say, decades, and uh, if we look back, we may say uh, five years, but t the technology to be there, there's still some work to do. Uh, we had, you know, uh, a drop of rains uh, that, uh, sorry, dust that just stopped the vehicle. The vehicle detected a, a cloud of dust and stopped. So uh, the, the sensors are very, very uh, uh, sensitive, and the, 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 the efficiency of the vehicle could, will have to be improved, and all the software will have to be improved. So technically, uh, there is some work to do. There's some, uh, clearly some work to do. And socially, we've seen and uh, we believe that the, the acceptance will be much faster than what we had thought before to test them with the public. And in both tests, we did it uh, with, uh, there was public uh, trial, and we're very impressed with the, the reaction of people. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McDonald, and I'll put you down as a volunteer to be the one that stands in front of that <laughs> bus tomorrow morning. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank Mr. Leclerc and Mr. Lemay. Uh, and I would like to remind noble senators that we'll meet tomorrow at 9.30 uh, at the main entrance of the East Block. We'll now suspend for a couple of minutes before we go in camera to discuss